Welcome to another of our discussions on the Book of Mormon. Today we'll be talking about 3 Nephi chapters 1 through 4. My name is Paul Hoskison, and I'm joined today by three of my esteemed colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. To my left is Tom Weymouth. Welcome again, Tom. Glad to be here. Todd, uh, welcome again. Todd Parker, thank you for being here. Thank you. And Michael Rhodes an old friend and, and a fellow uh, camper. Welcome again, Michael. It's good, good to have to you here. Thank you. Let us get into 3 Nephi. And the first thing that I would like to mention is the, uh, the little summary at the beginning of the book of 3 Nephi. Uh, there are the italics uh, uh, in between the title there and where chapter 1 starts. Uh, these are uh, statements that are probably on the gold plates. I think we can all agree to this, that Joseph Smith translated them. And they give us a little bit of a hint about what the record is and how it got started and a few other things. And I think I want to mention uh, some of that right now. Uh, and, and Helaman was the son of Helaman, who was the son of Alma, who was the son of Alma, who was the descendant of Nephi. We have a little bit of a genealogy here of the record keepers and of the prophets. And it's Nephi, the son of Helaman, who, who will be mentioned first in, in, in chapter 1. Uh, and then Helaman, of course, has a son who will factor later on uh, very prominently in, in the th uh, uh, third book of Nephi. Now, I'll also mention that there at the end of that little uh, introduction, it, it, we get a really firm date. The first time in the Book of Mormon we get a firm date. It says that, uh, that uh, Nephi, um, who was the son of Lehi, who came out of Jerusalem in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah. That is, Lehi and his family left Jerusalem in the first year of Zedekiah's reign. Uh, back in 1 Nephi, we have him receiving his vision in the first year of Zedekiah's reign. So the vision and, and leaving Jerusalem apparently happened all within about the same year. And then as we uh, turn the page and get into the uh, first chapter of 3 Nephi, one of the things that strikes us uh, is, is uh, Nephi, the son of Helaman, and what happens to him. Well, the Book of Mormon describes his departure in, in a little bit of detail in, in chapter 1, verse 3 in particular, and a little bit in verse 2. And they use terminology similar to when Alma departs and goes to the land of, of Mulek or heads in that direction. He disappears, and they, at that time, consider possibly he was buried by the hand of the Lord like Moses. In this case, I, I sense that this is recorded a little bit for longing because later on in, in the chapter they cert they want him back and it, it, it laments and he never came back, back and even though they're facing difficulties, oh what it would have been like to have him with us again. So I think you sense that here in this chapter a little bit more. We miss him and he was, he was great. He was the prophet. He was the son of the prophet. He uh, one of those great men, the one that the people turned to back in the book of Helaman to get baptized after Samuel preached to them, yes. Uh, I'm interested in verse uh, 6 there also uh, of chapter 1. And they began to rejoice over their brethren, saying, Behold, the time is past, and the words of Samuel are not yet fulfilled. These are the people that have not repented. And, and it, I think it's one of the hallmarks of evil people that they, that they uh, want to lord it over the people who are, who are trying to be righteous. They're, they want to uh, prove to them that they're wrong. And there's something about, about the, the unrighteous that, that makes them want to prove that they, are, that they are the good guys and that these righteous people are really the, the, the foolish, the, 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 the not smart ones. I think the Book of Mormon adds to an interesting insight because notice in verse 9, Samuel didn't really say a day. We, when he gave the prophecy, he didn't say, at least according to the Book of Mormon, five years from this day. But you notice they're listening very intently to that prophecy and now they've been able to set a date. So they are hearing the prophecy. It's not ignorance of it. It's now disbelief, a hard hearts or something that allows them to not accept it. So they're aware of the prophecies just like the believers are. And then, the beginning down there in verse 13, Nephi, after he's gone to the Lord with this problem, what are we going to do? These wicked people are going to try and, and kill all the people that believe. Uh, Nephi goes to the Lord and, and asks, what are we going to do now, Lord? 
I know, Todd, you have some thoughts on this. We're getting well, there uh, in verse 13, right? Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to back up to 12. Good. Notice, Good. it came to pass that he cried mightily unto the Lord all that day. I think there's a principle there that revelation doesn't just come. Even for a prophet, you just don't go asking, and, and it's immediately there. you got Enos praying all day and all night. He's praying all day. Uh, a friend of mine has a little thing on his wall that says, don't expect a $10,000 answer from a two-cent prayer. And so he, he, he uh, has to put in some time here, and then uh, notice the wording, and behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, lift up your head, be of good cheer, for behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given, and on the morrow come I into the world to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which has been caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. Now, at, <clears throat> at first glance, it, it sounds very much like this, uh, this is Christ speaking to Nephi uh, the day before he's born. So we have some questions there and some possibilities of uh, answers. Uh, how does this occur? Nephi's in America, Mary's in, uh, uh, in Bethlehem. So does uh, uh, one possibility is Christ's premortal spirit uh, prior to entering the body in Bethlehem comes here and speaks to Nephi. I, I personally don't, uh, I, I think the spirit's probably in the body before that time. Or if the uh, spirit's in the body, um, leaves the body and comes and, and speaks to Nephi and then, and then goes back. Uh, <clears throat> Or there's a principle called divine investiture of authority, and uh, this is one Elder McConkie uh, gave his opinion that he thought this was a messenger speaking in behalf of Christ by divine investiture of authority, which is possible. Uh, I, I uh, like what's in uh, Moses chapter five, verse nine, where Adam, uh, it's, it, well, let's just take a look at Moses chapter five, verse nine, and, and the wording there I think is, uh, significant from uh, Moses, which is in the Pearl of Great Price, which is the Joseph Smith translation of some uh, Genesis chapters. Uh, Moses chapter five, verse nine. Notice the wording. And in that day, the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning. See, the Holy Ghost is speaking by divine investiture, saying that he is the only begotten. So this could be the Holy Ghost speaking to Nephi, and I don't think we have to get hung up on any one of those. The message comes that he's coming into the world uh, on the morrow, and uh, because he's been very concerned about it, and people were gonna be put to death, and his prayer is then answered. I think also what you're saying, Todd, is that we probably can't use this verse to, to uh, um, extrapolate any doctrine from about when, when, when life begins. Right. When the spirit we, enters the body. When the yeah. spirit enters the body, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, with that aside, um, uh, let us get back into uh, the rest of the chapter there. I, I, there's some signs that are being talked about here in this chapter, uh, particularly uh, the no darkness and the no star, all of those signs appear. And, and people are gonna be uh, rationalizing this away and, and trying to misunderstand them. I know you had some thoughts on, on verse 22, Tom. Yeah, in particular, th this is an interesting statement being, you know, focusing in the New Testament. We often see that some statements there that signs don't convert people. We, we see numerous signs and and here we actually have that language. If, if we look halfway down that, it says, but notwithstanding these lines and deceivings, the more part of the people did believe and were converted unto the Lord. So two things happen here, in my opinion. One, we have people seeing the signs, and then we have a, a spin or an interpretation offered to say, well, no, they're not really, really signs of the Lord. And in chapter 16 of Helaman, it gives some possibilities. Well, that's not possible that it could have happened. That's not reasonable. Those were tricks of the mind, etc. But another effect here in this verse is that people are converted, and that's always caught my attention. Now, here's signs, and they convert. But uh, as we've talked, and, and I've considered this, if we were just turn the book a couple chapters later, they fall away very quickly. And maybe, maybe that word converted is, is a little strong to describe the change there. It, it's it's yeah. not a lasting conversion. No, it, it's typical yeah. of signs to have a short term. I'm excited about it now, but... Of falling away. Yeah, I've, I've often wondered if, if Reformed Egyptian has quotation marks. Probably doesn't. <laughs> no but if, if they were converted, because then you go over to chapter 2, verse 1, came to pass that thus passed away the ninety and fifth year also, and the people began to forget those signs and wonders which they had heard, 
in our verse 22, we learn from verse 26, it was the 90 and second year. So within three years, uh, they're not so converted. And uh, I, so you wonder if it's just a, a change in, in, in outward behavior rather than a change of heart sometimes. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think we have that too. Uh, it says they, they began to disbelieve what they had heard, imagining up some vain thing. And I think we can see that in the church too. You might have a, a young man fill a mission. You ca he has great, marvelous experiences, feels the Spirit, sees miraculous things, comes home, and then, uh, then goes inactive. You can talk to him and say, where did you go? Who's your president? What happened? He knows all the facts, but the thing that's different is he doesn't have that spiritual witness again. And I think they could still say these things happen, but the spiritual witness of what it was really happening, and that seems to be lacking. Yeah, it stops yeah. being an influence in their life. Right. right. Yeah. Then we get a little bit of a contention in verse 24. Todd, I know you also had some thoughts <clears throat> on that. Well, let's just uh, read the problem that came up. Verse 24. There were no contentions, save it were a few that began to uh, that began to preach, endeavoring to prove by the scriptures that it was no more expedient to observe the law of Moses. Now in this thing they did err, having not understood the scriptures. But it came to pass that they soon became converted, and they were convinced of the error which they were in, for it was made known unto them that the law was not yet fulfilled, and that it must be fulfilled in every wit. Yea, the word came unto them that it must be fulfilled, Yea, that one jot or tittle should uh, not pass away till all should be fulfilled. Therefore, in this same year uh, were they brought to a knowledge of this error and did confess their faults. I think we can see uh, uh, modern examples of this sometime almost every general conference. You hear rumors that there's going to be some big announcement and I don't even want to mention what they are uh, uh, they, to promote them. But uh, you have to wait until the revelation comes. Even, and even though they knew that eventually the law would be It was going to come, but their timing fulfilled. was wrong. Yeah, that, it was talked about back in 2 Nephi chapter 25, uh, verse 24. They, they kept the law of Moses, even though they knew that eventually it would be fulfilled and it would be done away right. with. So they're yeah. aware of the prophecies. They're yeah. just, like you said, they're but getting they the timing wrong. they saw the sign and they think, boy, this is the time. and. Uh, uh, and know that that had to be corrected. And we need to be a little careful to not run with the rumors, but, but go with the brethren and they'll let us know when things are come to pass and we don't need to speculate and try to uh, get into that Stage. kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. There, there's also a, a sharp contrast with the, the Jews and the, the uh, at the time of Christ, who didn't want to, uh, even after the gospel was there, they still didn't want to give up the law of Moses. So it, it, it's almost the opposite there. Mm -hmm. These yeah. people are anxious to give, to give it, it up. up. The Jews didn't want right. to, even after Christ had come. I yes. think one other thing that's in this verse, a little different perspective than that said, is I think behind this, we're, we're seeing all of this wickedness. And you, I ask myself, well, there's going to be 12 apostles or, or disciples called from this, and there's a prophet here. And I think this verse also shows a healthy church that is able, you know, as Todd said, that it isn't scholars sitting around and saying, is it finished now and we make the decision. This is, it looks like church down leadership to the, from the brethren down, no, here's how it went. So they're, they're receiving instructions somewhere in this verse. Mm -hmm. Now back in Helaman, uh, at the close of the book of Helaman, the Lamanites were more righteous than the Nephites. And, and now the Lamanites begin to lose some of that righteousness. I know, Michael, you've had some thoughts on verse 30 of chapter 1 there. Yeah, it, uh, in, in the few verses previous to that, it talks about the, the growth of the Gadianton robbers. And, and now uh, it says even the, the children of the Lamanites start joining these gangs, uh, you know, quite appropriate for our own time. And it says, uh, and thus were the Lamanites afflicted also and began to decrease as to the faith and their faith and righteousness because of the wickedness of the rising generation. These are decent, good uh, parents who are holding family home evening and teaching the gospel and, and still because of external influences, uh, some of their children are being led astray. And, and I think sometimes in the church, we, we, we have the, the false notion that if you're a good parent, you'll never lose your kids. When in fact, in this wicked society in which we live, you can do the best you can and still lose them. And, and these, these good Lamanite parents see that happening. So It, it must have been heartbreaking for them. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. as it is for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, we have the people beginning to forget the signs and wonders, as you mentioned earlier, Tom. Uh, you know, they had seen them. But it isn't that they forgot the signs and wonders themselves. What they, what they forget is, is the, the importance of them, what they mean in their lives, and so on and so forth. And they begin to rationalize there in verse 
too. Uh, Michael, I think you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, imagining up some vain thing in their hearts that it was wrought by man and by the power of the devil to lead away and deceive. The, the, the factual information is, is unchanged. It, it, it's their approach to it. And, and this rationalization process seems to be, well, and, and it, it clearly indicates that it's because of sin. As soon as you start sinning, the light goes out and, and you want to rationalize why you're sinning. And so you, you, you've got to explain away uh, things that, that before seemed so clear and, and true and, and, and uh, believable. Good, yes. Now going on down to uh, verses five and six, we get a little bit of chronology mentioned here. Uh, and, and before I turn to you, Todd, you're gonna talk about how their time reckoning uh, happens there uh, in, okay. in, in, right around verse eight. But before that, I wanna make a general remark here. Sometimes we try and correlate the, the Nephite calendar with our own calendar. And I think there's a, a, a question that we have to ask ourselves first before we can attempt to do that. And until we can answer this question, it's gonna be somewhat difficult to make that, that exact correlation there between them. For instance, uh, it's well known that the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, um, and, and without the intercalic months that are added periodically to bring them back in line with the solar calendar, it gets off from the solar calendar. And, and that's a 360-day year. So were the Nephites using the solar calendar 360 days a year? Or were they using perhaps an Egyptian calendar, which uh, one of the Egyptian calendars, a 365-day year? instead of the 365 and a quarter days, which was the Julian calendar. Certainly they were not using our Gregorian calendar with 365 and a quarter minus a little bit because we drop out leap year. Uh, and, and so uh, you, have to ask, you have to know which calendar they're using before you can try and correlate exactly. And I don't think it's really too important if we get the exact correlation. I just wanna mention that it might not ever be possible to figure out which calendar they were using. Nevertheless, they were using a typical Near Eastern way of keeping track of time, and that is by eras. And I think, Todd, you wanted to say something about that. Well, just from what's there, uh, verse five, a hundred years have passed away since the days of Messiah, who was king over the people of the Nephites, and 609 years had passed away since Lehi left Jerusalem. And then down to verse eight, now the Nephites began to reckon their time from this period when the sign was given. So I think just a, a, a big picture here is they, they first used to just have a, something that happened as a reckoning point, and that was from the time Lehi left Jerusalem. So in, in our calendar, that'd be from about 600 BC uh, down to the second way of reckoning, and that was the time of the judges, which was about 92 BC. And then they go, uh, then they, because they say several times, since the reign of the judges, uh, when that was uh, put in uh, at the ending of the book of uh, um, Messiah. Uh, Messiah with uh, uh, King Messiah before his, uh, his death. And then they mentioned uh, nine years passed away from the time the sign was given, so they, they still were talking reign of judges for a while, but after nine years, people, I think, had kept saying since the sign, and so they just switched over and said from the time the sign was given, so that, and that they used until the end of the record, and that coincides with what we do, the, the time of Jesus' birth. So you've got those three from the, the time Lehi left, the reign of the judges, and from the time the sign was given. And that's the, the system they're gonna use throughout the rest of the Book of Mormon. They, the, yeah, they, the, that's, the that's their, their reference points. Yeah, it's interesting that they would choose that same reference point, which the, the Christians in, in the old world came to a couple of centuries after the birth of Christ, but they're picking it up earlier here. Yeah. yeah. And then we get introduced here, one of the themes throughout the Book of Mormon, the, the Gideon robbers again. I mean, they've come up before, they're coming again, and this is gonna wreak some real havoc here, particularly uh, among the Lamanites to begin with. So the converted Lamanites in chapter uh, two, verse 12, therefore all the Lamanites who have been converted unto the Lord did unite with their brethren, the Nephites, and were compelled for their safety, uh, for the safety of their lives and their women and their children to take up arms against these, those Gadian robbers and so on and so forth. And this begins this protracted war that we're gonna read about now in chapters three and four. Um, and I think it's interesting too that uh, uh, these, these uh, Lamanites who uh, have been converted and to begin to unite with the Nephites, uh, in many ways become, for all intents and purposes, Nephites. The curses has been taken away because they're united with them, and they're fighting for the same cause now that the Nephites are fighting for. 
I think a couple of things that come out of this, you know, we, we often focus on the negative, but we're also going to learn uh, a powerful story about Laconius, or, or however we say his name, and that, so we had a Nephite righteous group, and whether they're probably pretty small by now, and then a Lamanite, and they all come together under one person, and then we see some really positive stories about Laconius, about him being a prophet and being inspired, and they talk about in verse 16 of chapter 3, and great and marvelous were the words and prophecies of Laconius. So we, there's a positive side, and not that we want the bad to bring about the good, but you know, the Book of Mormon does have that side to, that we can see, how a prophet saved their lives in this situation. And, and as an introduction to all of this, I, I wanted to mention back in chapter 2, the verses 18 and 19, uh, beginning there in the middle of verse 18, it's because of the wickedness of the people of Nephi that the robbers did gain many advantages over them. It wasn't because the robbers were powerful and mean, et cetera, et cetera. It was the Nephi wickedness is what allowed this to happen. And uh, eventually, this is going to be the undoing of, of the entire Nephite nation. We could even say, um, uh, we've seen it before, but here we get a, a grand exposure to it, the, what some people have uh, facetiously called Nephite-itis uh, stepping in, which eventually proves uh, fatal for the whole Nephite nation. Good, let's go on with the story of Laconius. We get his wonderful letter here, Michael. Do you want to say anything about his letter, beginning in verse 2 on, on, on down through verse 10? This is Laconius' yes, letter. Yes, it's the letter that Laconius receives from the, receives the, 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 from, the robber from the, baron. the Gadiant robber. And it, yeah. it's, 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 it's just a, a marvel in, in uh, uh, wicked eloquence. And twisting twisting the facts. You know, we're, we're a, a good society and you've wronged us rather than the other way around. And, and uh, we, we need to right those wrongs. And, but if you want to join with us and become one with us, then, then uh, everything will be all right. Can I interject one thing, sure, Mike, please, and then you can please. finish? Isn't it interesting here that he uses the rhetoric of good to describe the evil? Mm -hmm. well, you know, if he's openly evil, why can't he say, and we're evil? <laughs> Instead, he uses the language of goodness. You know, we, we, we are good. We have our ancient writings. And so it's the language of the church or the kingdom brought into this wicked groove. It's kind of chilling to me when I read it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in contrast to this, this uh, uh, evil manner of speaking here, uh, Todd, I know you wanted to say something about Laconius as, as the opposite of this, somebody who's forthright and honest. A, a kind of a comparison or a foil here. You learn about how bad uh, this Gideon High is. And then uh, starting in verse 12, Mormon wants you to know how good Laconius is. He says, uh, now this Laconius, the governor was a just man. So you get, he's a just man, couldn't be frightened by the threatenings of the robbers. And then later on, he did cause his people that he should cry unto the Lord, or that they should. So he's a just man, causes his people to pray. Verse 13, they gather together to fortify themselves. Verse 14, cause that they build fortifications uh, round about them. And uh, in the ending of 14, they place guards that are there day and night. And then in 15, he says, he calls them to repentance. So you see the, the bad guy contrasted uh, with the good guy. And uh, <clears throat> just a thought here, as we go through these, see, Christ is going to uh, come in chapter 11. And these are just proceeding as coming. And, and President Benson uh, preached quite a bit that uh, the Book of Mormon is a pattern for the last days and for the second coming. He said, uh, I've been reading again the marvelous account of the Book of Mormon, the visit of the resurrected Savior on the American continent. I've been deeply impressed with the beauty and power of this third Nephi account. And he said, the record of the Nephites' history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. Then he lists, pride is commonplace, dishonesty, immorality, secret combinations. And he says, uh, people were distinguished by ranks, chances for learning, even as today. And so as we read it, I think we should do as he says. We should say, why did Mormon, if he left out 99 things in the large plates and chose this one thing, why would he put this here and how does this apply to us now? And I think we can see a part of that in this contrast between these two individuals. Yes, and, and I think it's also, uh, besides the, the physical preparation, I think it's a metaphor for the evils that beset us today also. We are being attacked by, by evil combinations, not physically, but spiritually attacked by evil combinations. And what, uh, what Laconius does, 
to, to uh, prepare their defenses are the kinds of things that we need to do spiritually to protect ourselves yeah. against the assault Build by evil. Our spiritual reserves and, uh, so that we can withstand this siege of evil. Yes, and it's interesting that, there, that Laconius tells them not to go on the offensive against uh, right. the, the robbers there. Right, in, 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 verse, in 21. verse 21. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting too in 19 that it was the Nephite custom to appoint leaders that had the spirit of revelation, which we learn from John's testimony is the, is the uh, testimony of Jesus. So the Nephites pick people that have the testimony of Jesus and the Lamanites chose Nephite dissenters to stir up anger and, and keep the hatred yeah. uh, uh, warm. And, and the, 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 the military strategy based on the, the, the inspiration is very different than, than, than uh, what you know, normal military strategy uh, strategy would be. The, the, the Nephites say, let's go up and take out those bad guys. And uh, Gideon says, the Lord forbid, if we go up against them, we'll be defeated. Yes. We'll wait till they come against us. Uh, you know, a, a, a preemptive strike here is, is uh, said by this prophet, we, we won't do that. We will wait and defend ourselves against them, but we're not going to go up and, and, yeah. and take them out. And, and the, the, uh, let's emphasize again the two preparations that are made here by Laconius. One of them is the physical preparation. Gather yourselves together so that you can be physically there and, and, and be ready to defend yourselves. And number two is, is the call to repentance that is uh, mentioned several times in here. Then we get the actual battle in, in, that, that happens in, in chapter four. Um, and we don't need to go into a great deal of, of uh, detail about the battle. Suffice it to say that uh, the, the robbers can't hang on because they're, they can only survive by robbing and, they, and yeah. there's nobody to rob right. now. So they're, they're in farmers. a bad way. They're in a bad way. And, and the whole thing ends when they're trying to flee. Zarahemna is caught. He's hanged on a tree. And a, according to the law of Moses, again, Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23, he's hanged on the tree until sundown. Well, with that said, <clears throat> I wonder if, Michael, you can give us a very short summary in about 30 seconds. Well, let's, we, we, we start with uh, Helaman uh, departing. Uh, it's now 600 years from the time that... Uh, Nephi, right? Nephi departs. Yeah, I'm sorry, Nephi departs. Uh, and uh, 600 years from, from the time that uh, Lehi is left, we have the signs given that, that uh, the uh, prophet Samuel prophesied, uh, the, the uh, birth of Christ, uh, Many people are converted, uh, uh, but within a few short years, they, they begin to forget uh, and uh, become uh, wicked again. And uh, the Gadian robbers are on the increase because of this wickedness. Even the Lamanites are losing some of their children to this. Then we have some remarkable leaders in Laconius and uh, Gideon High who, who uh, pull the people together and get them to physically prepare and spiritually prepare to to uh, defeat these uh, robbers against them uh, and uh, are successful at it. Thank you. A wonderful lesson here and how to defend ourselves against the forces of evil in these latter days. Thank you. Absolutely.